25 years ago today, Mike Harris's progressive conservative government was sworn into office at Queen's Park. Harris had made history earlier in the month by becoming the first premier in more than 70 years to take his party from third to first in just one election. After 10 years of liberals and new Democrats at Queen's Park, Harris campaigned on the need for what he called a common sense revolution in Ontario. And observers predicted that by the time he was done, not one blade of grass in front of Queen's Park would fail to be trampled upon by some protester. They were right. And Ontario's 22nd Premier joins us now from Midtown Toronto. Mr. Harris, it's good to see you again. How are you managing through this pandemic? Well, Steve, as well as can be expected, uh, like everybody else, we're, we're working from home. Well, we're glad you could spare some time for us tonight. And I do want to go back to 25 years ago because, of course, many people watching us right now either didn't live in Ontario or may not even have been alive. So we need to tell a bit of the story here. What was going on in the province at that time that made you think we needed a so-called common sense revolution? Well, we'd had 10 years of kind of liberal NDP together and separate uh, government and uh, a buildup of, of significant annual deficits and a buildup of debt. And uh, it, it was our belief that, that this wasn't sustainable. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, in a number of areas in, in education that was just okay and healthcare that was just okay, a lot of things that we felt uh, needed to be done. Uh, infrastructure we felt falling behind at the same time as, as an 11 billion dollar annual deficit. So uh, we felt it was time for for a significant change, and um, it, it, we thought it was just common sense. And I think uh, once people heard it and understood it, I think they thought it was just common sense too. And yet it was kind of revolutionary. For example, we we said we were going to cut tax rates. Uh, and that that would produce more jobs and, in fact, more revenue for the government. That was counterintuitive. Uh, so in that sense, it was kind of revolutionary. We, we said we were going to unlegislate. We felt uh, we needed a rebalancing of, of labor legislation. Nobody had unlegislated uh, before. That, that was a no-no. And so that was kind of revolutionary. And some smart uh, fellows uh, sitting around the table <laughs> came up with, let's call it a common sense revolution. And that became uh, the name of it. And, and let's face it, it was, it was a campaign slogan, if you like. But it did describe, I think, relatively accurately what we felt needed to be done. It was actually a year before that 1995 election that you brought out the Common Sense Revolution document. And I'll ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, just to roll some pictures because you came into this very studio in 1994. There's Mike Harris, uh, a slightly younger fella. Uh, <laughs> on a show called Studio Two, where you and I talked about your Common Sense Revolution plans. Oh my God, look at that fella. Well. Um, <laughs> but during the course of that interview, here is how you describe the mission at hand. Sheldon, if you would, let's roll that clip. Uh, what's changed is we've had 10 years, the period we call the, the lost decade, uh, of some 65 new tax increases, massive buildup in government spending, a significant intervention by government into, uh, into the marketplace. Uh, and so what needs to happen now is, is to restore uh, the balance that Bill Davis had throughout the, that period of time. We do need a correction from this politics of the past 10 years. We need major change to get Ontario back on track. You know, it, it's interesting. You referenced Bill Davis there, who, of course, was Premier in the 1970s and 1980s. And, and you know, many people found it unusual that you would compare yourself to being a Bill Davis conservative because, of course, they think you're way more right wing than he was. <laughs> so help us figure that out, if you would. Well, I, I, listen, I, I got into politics because of Bill Davis. I admire him. I still do. Uh, I think he had the, generally the right balance, if you like, uh, between government and the private sector. Uh, and I felt that, that that had moved significantly, I don't like right wing and left wing, but let's say had moved significantly to the left, to bigger government, to more government, to, to more intervention into the private sector. And so, well, compared to the NDP and Bob Ray government that I was, uh, wanted to replace, uh, you could say I was right of them. Uh, and, and Bill Davis was considered moderate and in the middle. I felt I was just restoring 
uh, the Ontario government back to the to 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 the middle, and it had moved too far left. So that was, uh, you know, part of the analogy. And and I, I admired Bill Davis. I, I thought he was a man of great principle, uh, and and stood by what he believed in, and and used a lot of common sense. Was practical. Uh, you know, he wasn't dogmatic. Um, I know people felt I was more dogmatic or more right wing than him. I didn't believe so. Here is what you did when you came into power 25 years ago, and you did this almost immediately, and we'll bring this graphic up, and I'll read along for those listening on podcast. There were spending cuts, as you indicated, almost right away, $2 billion. You canceled photo radar, which was a very uh, controversial item the NDP had brought in. You canceled it. You cut welfare payments by 21%, but nevertheless, that left them about 10% above the national average. You repealed the previous Ray government's anti-strike breaker legislation, known as Bill 40. You very famously cut provincial income taxes by 30%. And then as time went on, you sustained a political protest by more than 100,000 teachers who protested your education reforms. And of course, further down the road, you created the so-called mega city, the new city of Toronto, uh, a form of government which still exists to this day. What do you think was the overall philosophy that those policy choices reflected? Well, the, the 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 education was was one where we felt, uh, you know, there were significant changes that were required to bring Ontario curriculum into the into the 21st century, if you like. Um, and uh, we eliminated grade 13. This brought us into sync with 50 states and all the rest of the provinces. Um, the we were behind in math and science, and there were significant, uh, you know. It was made tougher, if you like, uh, in in that area. But that education is a key part of of success for for jobs and for growth and for businesses uh, to succeed. Uh, and and a big part of our agenda was growing the private sector. We felt we had too much government, not enough private sector to to sustain it. Uh, Re-regulating the same thing. The uh, the welfare. Uh, we had uh, moved welfare payments in Ontario uh, to a, an average of about 50% higher than all the rest of the, you know, the average of the rest of the provinces. And, and it became better, for, if you like, or more financially rewarding to stay on welfare than go to work. And we, we, so we wanted to boost the private sector. We wanted to boost the jobs and opportunities. But at the same time, uh, we, we didn't want people to, you know, we wanted to break that cycle of dependency, if you like, on the state, on, uh, on welfare. And it, it was uh, controversial, but uh, hugely successful. If you look at, I don't know, some 700,000 off the welfare rolls, something like that, or five or 600,000 uh, off the welfare rolls and, and into productive jobs and, and away from dependence and, and into what, you know, into freedom, into being a, a, you know, the dignity of a job we used to call it. So it was all part of, uh, of what we felt needed to be done to get Ontario back on track. I wanted to ask you a bit about your style of leadership because I remember talking to a union, a teacher union leader at the time who said, every time a previous premier tried to bring in some kind of education reform we didn't like, we'd put thousands of teachers in the streets, we'd holler and holler, we'd march up and down whatever street it was, and then they'd back down a bit, put some water in their wine, and we'd find a happy place. And, and I remember him saying to me, this guy doesn't do that. This guy isn't going to compromise at all. How come you didn't? We'd spent, uh, well, you know what? I was a teacher. I was a trustee. I was a school board chair. I was involved provincially. I think I understood what needed to be done. I had uh, been in opposition for 10 years. I had been leader for five years, uh, traveling the province, uh, listening. Um, by the way, I had substantial teacher support for my election. Uh, as you know, they they uh, <laughs> they ended up against David Peterson. They ended up against Bob Ray. They ended up uh, eventually against me. They didn't like any change that they didn't think, you know, benefited them. And uh, and I understand that. That's what unions do. They put their their membership first, quite frankly. And uh, it was my job to put students first and and, uh, and to put families first. Uh, we felt we were on the right track. Uh, we campaigned, uh, you know, on on significant change. And, uh, to, you know, by the way, a lot of those changes we made in education are still in place today. Uh, and I think we've been proven right. Uh, was it perfect? No. Did we make some mistakes along the way? I'm sure we did. 
Uh, did we go a little too fast, a little too slow? That happens, uh, you know, when you're implementing change. But by and large, I think we moved in the right direction. And I think in the end, the public understood it. By the way, I've had run into lots of teachers uh, who have said to me, uh, you know, you know, we 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 understand a little better today, uh, you know, what you were trying to do and what you did, and uh, you know, uh, we, we're we're not we're not so opposed to to everything you stood for. Well, you won't be surprised to hear that uh, I do want to talk about some of the mistakes from 25 years ago. And mind you, I'll, I'll set it up this way. You know, um, the, the slogan on your government was in those mid to late 1990s, you know, he said he did what he said he was going to do. And as far as what you campaigned on in the Common Sense Revolution, that was true. And in fact, when you went for re-election in 1999, you won a second consecutive majority, and which hadn't been done in three decades, and um, with a slightly higher percentage of the total votes cast as well. However, uh, the knock on you was that when stuff came up that you had not campaigned on or planned on, your government didn't react as well. And I'm thinking here of, for example, the, the, the tragedy of the six deaths in Walkerton from tainted water. I'm thinking of Ipperwash where a protester was killed. Do you think, with the benefit of 25 years of hindsight, that that's a fair knock on your government, that you didn't handle the stuff that came up as well as the stuff you planned? Um, I, well, I, I don't think in the two cases you bring up. I mean, I think uh, Walkerton was a, was a tragedy. I was premier at the time. Uh, I'm not sure there was, uh, quite frankly, anything that our government did uh, that that precipitated uh, that. The uh, and and you know Dudley George uh, was an unfortunate tragedy. Uh, uh, the only action our government took was was we sought an injunction and. Uh, uh, you know, it, it happened under my watch, and and obviously I regret uh, that both of those things uh, happened. But in hindsight, uh, was there something that I could have done different, or a government could have done different? I'm I'm, I'm not so sure. Uh, you know, that would have prevented those. The the mega city was is brought up by a lot of people. You know, if you like <laughs> the amalgamation, we didn't campaign on that. We did campaign on if there's a better way to do things. We we'd like to uh, uh, we'd like to hear about that and. Uh, you know, it, it wasn't handled quite as smoothly as some uh, things that we did. And on the other hand, particularly in the case of Toronto, uh, I felt it was important that uh, that we needed a world class city. And to have a world class city, uh, you needed some scale and you needed some size. Uh, and I also felt that uh, that the city of Toronto unfairly was taking on the burden of uh, a lot of, of social costs that uh, that the surrounding municipalities uh, did not did not have, and and uh, I just think it made it sense. And and you know when I traveled the the world after taking over and and, and financial centers and whatnot, uh, everybody had heard of Canada, everybody had heard of Toronto, nobody knew what Ontario was, uh, and uh, you you need uh, world class cities. Uh, quite frankly, at least I felt you did, and I still feel you do, uh, to be successful. And, and I think Toronto, by and large, has been a success. Some of the other amalgamations were challenging, and I think we made some mistakes uh, there, maybe too quickly, maybe too much. Uh, not everything worked out, but you know what? Generally, uh, I suppose it's a fair knock on things that we didn't campaign on because... Uh, you know, those were things we didn't have five years to plan and figure out how to do. Hmm. Uh, I, I want to ask you more about your brand of conservatism in as much as I think it's fair to say that when a conservative party takes over either federally or at Queen's Park, social conservatives think they have an ally in that person. And uh, I also think it's fair to say that you left a lot of social conservatives very disappointed because you didn't recriminalize abortion or attempt to do that. And when the courts decided that dozens and dozens of Ontario laws had to come into compliance with a ruling that gave same-sex partners additional rights, you did it. You didn't appeal the decision, you just went along with it. How come? Well, I'm, I'm a big believer that, that religion, if you like, which drives a lot of these thoughts on, on uh, 
uh, on abortion and and uh, on on gay rights and marriage and whatnot. I, I don't think they belong in politics. I, I I don't think that's why we elect governments. We leave that to churches. We leave that to individuals. We leave those those uh, decisions and uh, in, in the hands of others and 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 of individuals. So it, it didn't make sense to me that uh, that's why we were elected. We were elected to to uh, uh, provide those things that people can't provide for themselves and healthcare and education and social programs and, and uh, safety and, 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 you know, in those areas. So, uh, and those were things that were, you know, divided uh, uh, people. And uh, uh, I, you know, had spent a considerable amount of time with my party and with my caucus, not everybody, you know, jumped on board right away. Uh, with that philosophy, but I said, well, here, here's things that unite us. Here's things that we were elected to do. Um, and, uh, and by and large, I had unanimity amongst the caucus, and I was pretty proud of that. You know, even the, the, back in the day, same-sex benefits was, was, you know, we're going back 30 years, 35 years. Bob, uh, David Pearson promised to bring it in, had a massive majority of government, couldn't get it through his caucus. Uh, the NDP, Bob Ray promised to, to bring it in, had a majority, couldn't get it through his caucus. So I, 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 I you know, maybe the timing was, was better for us, but I was pretty proud of the fact that we had unanimity uh, in that. And part of that, you know, goes back to, uh, you know, when I was newly elected, I was chairing a, a Natural Resources Committee and, and Bob Elgie had a controversial bill that was uh, brought um uh, brought gay rights into the, uh, you know, covered under the, the uh, human, human rights, rights code. code. Yes. Yeah, that was very controversial at the time. And uh, they sent that bill to my committee, uh, not a natural committee for human rights legislation. Uh, but, you know, we, we got that through. And it's just been, you know, my philosophy. I do want to take advantage of your being here to bring you a little bit fast forward and talk about some current events, because uh, as strange as it sounds, you've been out of politics for almost two decades now, and the only Conservative Party leader to win an election since you is the guy who currently has the job, and that's Doug Ford. And unlike you, who had a great deal of experience before becoming Premier, Mr. Ford had none. He had no experience in provincial politics before becoming Premier. In your view, and I know you've advised him behind the scenes a little bit, in your view, how ill-prepared was he for the job he eventually got two years ago this month? Well, he wasn't well-prepared. He certainly wasn't as well-prepared as I was, because I'd had time in government, I'd had time in opposition, I had five years to plan. Uh, and, and, you know, some, I remember, criticized him and said, you know, uh, you, you, you know, you don't seem to be as well prepared as Mike Harris was. Well, how could he been? You know, five or six months before the election, he was running for mayor. He had no provincial experience, uh, so he was he was still you know learning things on the fly, if you like. And a large part of his government was as well. So I don't think it's a fair comparison to the, the amount of planning that, that I had. But let me say this: uh, you know, while he had a, a challenging start. Uh, he's, he's performed amazingly well, and he's a quick learner, and he's demonstrated a, a, a kind of uh, empathy and balance throughout this COVID uh, uh, situation, and he's learned from any you know, mistakes that he's made. And I, I think he's facing far greater challenges today uh, than I felt, and I think, uh, by and large, he's handling it very, very well. Well, I should ask you about COVID as well, because as has been reported, you are the chair of one of the biggest long-term care home providers yeah. uh, in the province of Ontario. And you know that the New Democrats have, have said that the lesson of COVID-19 is that we really shouldn't have any more private owners or operators of long-term care homes in the province going forward, that they should be all part of the continuum of care that our health care system provides. And I should give you a chance to comment on that. What's your view on it? Well, the NDP want government to provide everything. That's socialism uh, at its best. And uh, it's an ideology that they have that anywhere around the world it's been tried doesn't work very well. Uh, the, the big problem uh, in long-term care uh, in Ontario, and it, has, it is a problem, and it's been a problem for many, many years. We're short of spaces. We have older homes that have, should have been rebuilt over the last 15 years, 16 years, have not been rebuilt. 
you know, we had uh, a significant uh, backlog when I came into office. We built uh, our commitment was 20,000 new beds. We built those. They're all modern. Those homes, whether private or not for profit, uh, have done relatively well. Uh, but uh, the older homes have not done very well, whether they're in the hands of, of, of the private sector or in the hands of, of the nonprofits. Um, quite frankly, there's, there's really not much profit. In fact, and, and I would argue there's no profit in long-term care. Uh, Chartwell has about 10 or 11% of our, our residences are long-term care. The rest are retirement residences. A hundred percent of the money we get from the government is spent uh, on on the services, but there's not enough money, and there hasn't been for the last 15 years, I would say. Uh, and uh, there, there's still 30,000. I think we rebuilt about 17,000 beds when we were in government from the old, you know, four four bed wards, the narrow hallways, and whatnot. Those ones. Uh, there's still 30,000 that that should have continued to have been been uh, built. Again, whether they're private sector or whether they're nonprofit, and and that wasn't done. Secondly, I, I think it's obvious that governments uh, were ill prepared for this pandemic and ill prepared to deal with it in in long term care. And you're starting to see some of the analysis now of, uh, of lack of, of personal protection equipment and whatnot. But I, I don't think the issue is whether it's it's uh, how it's incorporated. Uh, I, I think the issue uh, is, is, is one more of preparedness, of being ready. Uh, quite frankly, some of the larger for-profit, if you like to call them, uh, have, have had economies of scale. Uh, Chartwell, for example, early on when we couldn't get PPE from federal or provincial governments, uh, we were sourcing it uh, ourselves. We helped a number of the nonprofits. Uh, who had no clout and had no uh, resources, we helped them as well with, with personal protection equipment and uh, at the same time. But uh, you know what? Uh, I agree with Doug Ford that, that the system needs a complete uh, overhaul, and part of it is, is a significant lack of funding. Hmm. We're down to our last minute here, and I want to ask you one last thing. Even though you've been out of public life for almost two decades now, your name gets raised at Queen's Park all the time. You still are an amazingly polarizing person. Why do you think that is? Well, we've brought about a lot of change. Uh, I, I think uh, the, the change we brought about was was uh, positive. Uh, the, uh, so either positively or, or negatively, for some reason or other, uh, uh, I, I guess on the negative side, I, it's usually the NDP or liberals uh, bring me up. Uh, I wear it, I guess, as a badge of honor. Uh, I'm proud of my time in office. Uh, were we perfect? No. Uh, but we did do what we said we would do. And, and by and large, uh, we took them, you know, I call it the, the trifecta, the trifecta of, of taking $11 billion deficit, turning it into a surplus uh, at the same time as we cut tax rates at the same time as we created uh, hundreds of thousands uh, of new jobs. That was an important trifecta that gave Ontario the resources to, to be able to invest massively into, you know, the first subway system that had been done in 25 years, into the arts, into new hospitals, into the biggest expansion of colleges and universities there. Those dollars came in because we got the private sector booming. Uh, and, and even at lower tax rates, we got substantially more dollars in. That, that that's an impressive trifecta, I believe, and it's a and it's a lesson for future government. Mr. Harris, thanks for spending some of this 25th anniversary with us here on TVO tonight. Take care. Thank you very much. The agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.